Well, thank you so much, Iva, and everybody for coming and being and getting this organized. Um, very happy to be here with you. And um, I think you said it really well, Iva, the, the problem that we've seen across the state is a lot of the misinformation that's happened uh, with these small towns. And Jasper is not the only one. We've seen a lot of places that have passed this without public hearing, without any kind of debate. Uh, they only listen to what the marijuana salespeople are telling them. And uh, that's, that's a real shame because this is such, such an important issue where people need to be educated because this will permanently change the dynamics of your community. And the people deserve to have time to debate this and discuss this. So I applaud you for um, catching on to it and dealing with it in a timely manner. Just like you said, once the investors get their license fees paid, they put money into the community and build their dispensaries or whatever other activity they're doing, they will be entrenched. They will influence everything in your community, eventually um, having a say in who your representatives are from the top down, who your judges are, how your police uh, department runs, and everything else. And uh, Walker Baptist will be, will, their, their ERs will eventually be overwhelmed. Not overnight, but it, it, but it will happen. So what I'm going to do is uh, just kind of jump to some key parts in this presentation that I've given to um, certain people across the state, uh, listening to some of the questions that people in Jasper may have already. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit to um, some of the key things that are wrong with this law uh, to help you understand why it is so important for you to make sure that Jasper opts back out so then you can debate the issues and prevent from opting back in. One of those main arguments being that the law right now currently is so bad that no one has any business letting the marijuana industry in at this point. We need to see a lot of changes happen in Montgomery first. And if you do not opt out back out now and you just let them come in, the opportunity to really see some good changes happen in Montgomery will go by because there will not be the kind of pressure that we need to make sure that these changes happen. Ideally, I'd love to see the whole thing repealed, but um, that you know that's an issue for another day. Uh, my main focus at this point in time is that we're going to protect our babies. We're gonna protect our children our teenagers, um, and our overall community safety. So there's a lot of key things. I'm gonna just uh, focus on maybe our top three at this point. So one of the most egregious parts about our law and our current rules with, from the Cannabis Commission is that it will be very easy for pregnant women to purchase the marijuana products. They are marijuana, they do have THC, they may have a full potency THC for all we know, because there are no potency caps in this law. But there's only one very weakly written rule from the medical board that tells these certified cannabis doctors that give the uh, card recommendations, it's not a prescription. Um, a physician cannot prescribe whole plant marijuana. But when a woman of childbearing years comes in, He's not allowed, or he or she, the, the cannabis physician, are not allowed to give the card to a pregnant woman, a woman intending to be pregnant, but they do not require a pregnancy test. So it's very easy for a woman to say, no, I'm not pregnant. I don't plan on getting pregnant. And then that's all they have to do. There's no other follow-up. And we can get into this a little bit later, but uh, in more detail, cannabis, all cannabis is extremely damaging to a developing baby. It is what we call teratogenic, meaning it causes major birth defects. If you've heard of thalidomide in the past, where it was a medication and um, babies were born without arms and legs, cannabis does the same thing. Right now, there's a medicine on the market called Accutane. It is an acne medicine, and it's very effective, but it's very damaging to a developing baby. 
And so right now uh, at the pharmacies and legitimate pharmacies, uh, they have to abide by a program where women of childbearing years using that medicine have to have a negative pregnancy test before they can pick up their medicine. And that is what we are wanting to do um, in this case. If they're going to call this product medicine, we should at least make sure we're protecting our babies and making sure that pregnant women cannot purchase these products. Right now at this point in time, they will be able to do so with ease and that will have very dangerous effects generationally down the line. Um, we do not require any uh, mental health testing or IQ testing when this is going to be given to children. Anyone under the age of 19 has to have a caregiver um, and the conditions list is so broad and there's no uh, limitation. So basically a, a child who says they have depression, a parent can become a caregiver and start giving them marijuana, but there's nothing that's requiring us to really follow up and protect the child. Um, the age for getting your own card is far too young. A 19 year old can get in and get their own card. Um, and you as the parent, the grandparent have no say in the matter. We should have a minimum age, at least of 25 to protect brain development. Um, another part of our law that's really, really terrible is the fact that caregivers can also be users. This should not be. Um, to be a caregiver means you just have to be 21 and registered with the Cannabis Commission. Uh, you could be the parent, grandparent, a, a legal guardian, but you can also be a nurse's aide um, and you can have up to 10 patients and you can be paid to purchase this marijuana and give it to the patients but you can also be on it yourself. I've never in all my years of giving anesthesia <laughs> ever been on anesthesia medicine at the same time I have a patient asleep on the table undergoing surgery. Yet in our law, we can have this, that needs to change. Uh, we also have, um, we should not have parents and children using marijuana in the house together, but right now that is completely possible. Another, another problem that's just really top of the list is the conditions list. There are 14 conditions that are allowed for you to be able to get a marijuana card. Um, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's not based on science. It's not based on good medicine. It's based on politics and on business. So what we have right here, after talking about some of the worst aspects of the law, where we, we have a lot to fix before anyone can even consider doing business with the marijuana industry, which I would advise against at, at pretty much any point. Because we already have cannabis-based medicines that are FDA approved. They are available for patients where cannabis, where CBD and THC mainly can provide some help for some conditions. Cannabis does not cure anything and it is not really a, a legitimate uh, help for almost any kind of condition, real studies show, but it can provide some help. So we have medicines like Epidiolex, Marinol, Sesamet, Syndros, uh, that are either pure CBD or THC, they're synthetic based, so you're not worried about contamination from growing it from a plant and processing it from a plant. And the Epidiolex is newly developed for rare resistant seizures. It has some effectiveness. It has far better effectiveness than any whole plant or off the shelf uh, health store CBD would have. But even in, even in its own way, it's still very limited. Um, the other THC derivatives are used for poor appetite or nausea with cancer or AIDS, muscle spasticity from certain neurodegenerative disorders, uh, they can use it for end of life purposes to um, increase appetite for some people who are uh, suffering that way. And um, the, the benefit though is, is that these are FDA approved where we are very certain of the sourcing of the materials, the testing of its dosing profile for safety and efficacy. We know that for certain. We know its potency concentration, all of those things because it's required by law to do that. And a doctor can prescribe it, pharmacies can sell it, insurance covers it, and doctors can even use these medications for off-label. Label. So if they wanted, they could use a little bit of Epidiolex, which is a pure CBD, with maybe some Marinol, uh, which is a pure THC. Uh, they have those options. 
So what you're getting, what your Jasper leaders, however, uh, said, yes, we'll do business with is the marijuana industry. And this is whole plant marijuana that is grown with all of its many hundreds of chemicals. And um, it's not FDA approved. A doctor cannot prescribe it. They only give a recommendation card. Pharmacies have nothing to do with this. These so-called dispensaries are also known in other states as pot shops. And, and what you find is, is that when in states that have both medical and recreational, the same product is sold in the same store. The label medical versus recreational, only the only difference is the taxes you pay on the product. Louisiana only had their medical program for, for two years, maybe, and they've already gone to smokable marijuana to help their more uh, economically distressed patients get cheaper product. Um, Arkansas said, oh, we will never have recreational. We won't even consider it. Yet within two years of having their medical program, the marijuana industry pushed them uh, to consider recreational, and they had a huge statewide referendum, which fortunately, Arkansas did vote down. But there were two other states, uh, Missouri and another, that voted theirs in. And these are all the same people saying, oh, we'll never, never do recreational, but they keep pushing. And as a matter of fact, the, the marijuana people from Arkansas are doing business already with marijuana people in Alabama, and they've, you know, wrote a $100,000 check for Kay Ivey's campaign. So it's, it's all embedded there. So that's the difference between true medical cannabinoids and what we are getting versus what we're getting, which is a, uh, just basically marijuana. So we have right here, um, Dr. Mark Johnson, uh, who wrote an op-ed last year. He is the president of the Colorado Medical Society. And he said, after 20 years, it's clear that marijuana is not medicine. He said that immediately when they started their medical program, there were the majority of 18 to 25 year olds coming to get a card for back pain. And I don't know about you, but I would love to have a 20 something year old's version of back pain, <laughs> which would, uh, it would be nothing compared to what I've had before. These are some really good resources for you if you want to take a picture of this screen. Um, there are lots of really good solid resources. I'm just narrowing it down to a few. So this is Isaac. You can go to isaacone.org. It's, it's purely medical. It's great for all um, science and medically based people. They have a speaker series. It's top notch. For a more layperson perspective called johnnysambassadors.org. Um, it was founded by this mother, Laura Stack. She's the one I told you about where her 19-year-old son got his card and within a year he was dead from suicide. Um, and then there's another one called learnaboutsam.org. It's very good mix of science, medicine, and public policy. If marijuana was so great, then why do we have all of these medical organizations against dispensary marijuana? If you'll look at the list of all these organizations, even the American Epilepsy Society, uh, the International Association for the Study of Pain has said repeatedly, uh, whole plant marijuana is really no better than placebo for chronic pain issues. It has nothing to do with helping your arthritis pain at all. Um, in fact, what they're finding is that the longer you use any THC product, even this THC, uh, the Delta 8s and the Delta 10s that we're getting from the hemp farmers. Uh, so any chronic THC exposure where it's from marijuana or from another cannabis such as hemp will actually alter your opioid receptors, making you crave opioids more in the long run. Your tolerance for pain goes down and the dependency on opioids actually goes up. And we all know the problems that Walker County has had. It will only get worse. As Dr. Finn, uh, one of our experts from Colorado said, fentanyl and marijuana uh, play in the same sandbox. Get rid of that. So for example, it's a concept we call priming the brain. In Colorado, um, as marijuana use is expanded, this is a graph of opioid abuse and overdose, overdose deaths. So the myth that marijuana will help with our opioid crisis is completely false. 
we have an endocannabinoid system already within our body. That's where we see the CB1, CB2 receptors. Um, and those are the ones that are being stimulated. THC is the psychoactive chemical within marijuana. Um, it is also when you get Delta 8s and Delta 10 for THC from your hemp, those also are uh, psychoactive and um, it's very harmful and it damages those natural receptors. And that's what ends up developing a dependency and an addiction. It can actually worsen PTSD and mental health. We see increases in schizophrenia and psychoses, especially for those that are exposed at a young age. That's why it's so critical. We close those legal loopholes to prevent teenagers from getting it. Um, it actually increases the risk, and I'll tell you more about this, of autism. We will see more autism, autistic kids, when they are exposed in utero. And when young men use cannabis, they damage their sperm and increase autism rates. So with the baby, never, ever, ever should any woman that is pregnant use marijuana, but they should also, they should not use any cannabis. They should never use CBD. They should never give their children CBD. Uh, it is DNA toxic. It damages the DNA, but specifically back to the marijuana, which is, you know, but we're having both marijuana and CBD mixtures in, in the dispensaries. Um, there's increased risk of brain abnormalities, cognitive disorders, lower IQs, and the shocking, the shocking data that's been coming out about increasing autism rates. Uh, for a while, uh, they thought there just might be correlation, but now they know it is causation. So in Florida, ever since they started their medical program, uh, use by pregnant women has gone up 400%. Uh, these are studies that have started where they're showing that the male sperm is genetically changed for good, and they pass those changes on to their offspring, increasing both autism and cancer. So when we keep looking at the maps and how they change, that might be correlation, but now that we can see uh, data in the lab and in animal studies, all those factors come together and show causation. This is not a health product. Cannabis is not a health product. It damages the egg, it damages the sperm, it damages the developing baby and it damages the child. And we, we, we have to keep it out of young people's hands as much as possible. Just another pointing to the autism. This, this chart right here is pointing to how you can predict. So the looser your marijuana laws, you can predict 10 to 30 years out about how many more autism cases you will see in your state. When you have dispensaries in your area, it is much more likely for children to be exposed accidentally um, there are no rules about parents or and caregivers having lock boxes to keep their products away. More children um, will use marijuana and one of the number one predictors of future opioid addiction and abuse yeah. is previous marijuana use. We've also found that cannabis or marijuana use is very deadly for children by child abuse. Let me go to this little slide right here. So this is a chart from Texas, and this is a chart from Florida. Um, not all states measure the substances that are involved related to the death of a child from abuse or neglect, but a few states do. Alabama does not yet. And wherever this is measured, they find that marijuana is the number one substance involved and the death of a child from abuse or neglect, mostly by neglect. And it's surprising, but it's consistent across the board. Marijuana is number one every time. Drownings, uh, being left in a hot car, uh, fires in the home, getting a gun um, and accidental shootings. Uh, there are many, many uh, reasons why children die when somebody else is on marijuana. And you know, you may think, well, this is the medical stuff. This. This is not the recreational stuff and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter because THC is THC is THC. And what matters is the potency, the frequency of use and the age that you start. So we don't have really protections for any of that right now. And we need, we need more protections.
So this is some other shocking information that has come out just in the year 2022 and 2023. Uh, there's an excellent researcher out of Australia. I've talked with him many times. This is one of his papers that he published this past year. And that's talking about how carcinogenic cannabis is. All cannabinoids. We're talking CBD to THC to everything. And in his conclusion right there, it says data suggests that cannabinoids, including THC and cannabidiol, which is CBD, are important community carcinogens, exceeding the effects of alcohol or tobacco. Testicular, prostatic, and ovarian tumors indicate mutagenic corruption of the germline in both sexes. That means the DNA in egg and sperm are corrupted. Pediatric tumorogenesis confirms transgenerational oncogenesis. That means that they're seeing pediatric cancers that are increasing are related to the DNA passed from their cannabis using parents. Then this next phrase, quantitative criteria implying causality are fulfilled. What that means is the hard numbers, the hard data that can make you claim this is causal, that cannabis use is causing increased cancers and increased pediatric cancers, those requirements are fulfilled. And that is what was just so completely shocking. Right here, just looking at community safety aspects. Um, unfortunately, in Alabama, our data collection is not very good. But of the counties that do toxicology screenings for mm -hmm. motor vehicle accidents and deaths, in 2021, their report showed that uh, marijuana, if you see right here at the top, Delta 9 THC is the number one substance and DUI arrests and crashes already, already, before the first dispensary opens. And in 2021, it was number two for traffic fatalities. Anybody have any questions before I pull up the next slide? Um, the, the foreverness of the damage to the egg and sperm of users, did that result in child uh, deformities and, and things like that? Now this is uh, in utero exposure. So the damage usually to the egg and the sperm, um, you're going to see the behavioral disorders, uh, children with psychoses, lower IQ, panic disorders, autism, other behavioral disorders. Uh, that's from genetic changes to the egg and sperm. You will also uh, see increased cancer rates. Pictures that are here now are in utero exposure, and this is why it is so critical uh, that we have protections. I was given permission to show this. I apologize if this is just if it's just too graphic. We have we see increased rates of children with cardiac disorders. Um, we're even seeing this in states where you have uh, watershed from uh, pot farms. And cephaly is very, very uh, highly linked to cannabis use. Um, Holoprosinephaly, uh, this is what we saw a lot of with uh, thalidomide, um, but this is also caused by cannabis. So if you have a pregnant lady using a cannabis product, either CBD or THC based um, around days 22 to 26, it will interrupt the budding and development of arms, hands, fingers, legs, feet, and toes. Uh, Gastrochysis is just where we don't have the um, intestines closing. Christina, I have a question. Yes. You, you said um, that the state of Alabama allows dispensaries. Is that, is that state law? In, in the law, they've said that you can only have a dispensary if your city council and or county commissioners officially opt in. And that means that only applies to having a dispensary in your community or what we call an integrated facility. And that's what the investors <laughs> really want. They want the integrated facility because then they can grow, process, transport, and sell it all on site. When, when there are cities or, or, or counties that have been ahead of this and they've gotten in touch with me and invited me to come out and speak and we were able to get it stopped, we caught them, we caught these salespeople uh, mm -hmm. telling the local leaders, oh, no, 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 we don't, we don't want dispensaries, we don't, you know, we don't want to make this 
you know, a big center for all this. All we want to do is just process, but yet they're pressuring the council, city council to hurry up and <laughs> pass an ordinance and opt in for this integrated facility license. And so we caught them in the act, say, for example, in Aniana. Well, we all knew why they were doing that because they wanted to have the most broad permissions <clears throat> possible so that later on they could come in and bring those dispensaries. They just need to get their foot in the door. Now, where it comes to having a cultivation site, which is a, a pot farm, a grow site, or having a processing, you don't have to opt in for that. That's already a possibility. So what you have to do is make sure that your zoning laws are really, really tight. Uh, so that, uh, so for example, I live in Shelby County and our Shelby County commissioners and our executive uh, you know, refuse to opt in for any dispensaries, but they've also changed their zoning laws, uh, their zoning, so that anybody that wants to come in to process or to grow will have such a high burden to jump over. They would, they would technically have to petition for zoning changes, and that's very difficult to do. So they've, um, our, our leaders have done a really good job of preventing that through zoning. I said, how are you seeing that some of these items are getting added to the city council agendas? Is the city council bringing this up or are they best, the people have to have a vested interest in having the dispensaries, putting that pressure on the city council to bring it up as an agenda item? It's the latter. It's usually the, uh, because they're very well funded, you know, the marijuana industry is very well funded by other industries in other states. Um, big Tobacco is a huge investor in uh, Big Green or Big Marijuana now. So they have many, many people being paid to go across the state and address every city, town, county possible. They do their little presentation and give their spiel and, the, and make promises of how much money that, you know, their little town's going to make. Uh, which never really comes out to be be true. Um, the cost benefit ratio is always in the negative for um, a municipality in the long run when you consider the societal costs. Now, places like Birmingham, you know, I think they probably sought it out. They were eager. They're ready to do it. It will, it, it will become a haven for it. Unfortunately, I do know from examples from some cities. They did not want to have any kind of public hearing because they didn't want their people to know, and they kept it secret on purpose. I'm not saying that was the case for Jasper. I do know that it was the case in other cities. Regarding um, the birth defects and babies, uh, if the parents uh, say maybe three years, you know, free of uh, marijuana, they hadn't smoked in three years, and then the mother gets pregnant, is that a safeguard? I mean, how long does the marijuana stay in your system where it will be a, a problem for your, your child? That's a good question and it's hard to answer uh, because it, it depends on the situation. So ultimately the impact of cannabis is gonna be worse by the dosing and frequency of use, right? Any substance is going to be more potent when the dosing, the potency and, and frequency of use. And a lot of times that's why you end up seeing uh, for, you know, in the cancers, when you see bladder cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian, you know, all these, these kind of cancers that concentrate fat, you know, and, and THC loves, you know, any, any cannabis is uh, what we call lipophilic. It loves fat and concentrates there. So it'll stay there and sit there. And that's where it does its DNA damage. So cannabis is very attracted to the ovaries and to the testes because it's very lipo uh, fat soluble. So the longer someone uses it, the more frequently the potency that's there is going to impact the level of DNA damage that will happen and that will get passed to the child. Um, and the testes sperm is made new over time, but what we've seen now, there's some new data coming out. Let's just go back to the mother. And if she's carrying a boy and she uses cannabis, um, not only will we have the effects to the brain and potential effects that, uh, that you saw in those pictures of the, of the birth defects, we now know that it affects the, 
the germ line of that developing baby boy's testes so that before he's even born, he will, he's destined to basically make bad sperm. So he could be just infertile. He may not be able to have children. He may be more likely to have children with birth defects. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we do know it's affected even, even when on in the little baby. Now, when a mother is carrying a baby girl, we already know that that baby girl's eggs are already formed before she's even born. So there will be damage to those pre-born eggs in that little baby girl's um, ovaries uh, before she's born, before she ever starts puberty. So there will be some level of damage right then. Um, that's, that's what we know. Um, it's, it's just hard to know how much you recover after you've stopped using um, surely the body heals itself and fixes itself. It's designed by God to do that. I just don't have the specific data to say, oh, well, if you stop for five years, you're going to be fine. We just, we just don't know yet. Christine, I was wondering, um, you know, with computers now, it seems like it would be pretty easy for anyone to uh, fake a cannabis card. You know, we see that with driver's licenses and the Vax, Vax cards that, people have. Have you heard of that yet? Or, um, you know, through other, from other cities that they're finding that people are faking it, cards? It's, I would, I would think um, it's pretty easy. Uh, what I do know is that if you heard in Oklahoma, maybe it was it a month ago where there was that, um, that killing of Chinese nationals at a pot farm and it was an illegal grow which is very typical but it they had fake papers <laughs> and so what they find is is that in every single state and see this is what happens and we've got it with our alabama commission oh we're going to be highly regulated we're going to check everything it's all going to be on the up and up and it never works out wherever you wherever you go and further legalize, the illegal grows come, become out of control. Uh, and that's where we see in every state. And, you know, poor Oklahoma, I mean, it is just literally the Wild West. Um, they have more pot shops than they have churches now. So what we see is that there are foreign mafia, foreign nationals coming in, especially in the states out west, uh, they've, they've had a foothold in Oregon, Washington, California for quite a long time. Uh, they're now, it's being reported to be a problem in New Mexico, Oklahoma. Uh, they're taking over Native American sites and doing illegal grows there. Um, so surely if these people can grow illegally and come up with fake papers, uh, coming up with a card is possible. Now the commission is going to have some type of patient registry system it's supposed to be a computer system linked with the commission, with every dispensary. Um, Aaliyah should be able to access it. Uh, pharmacists should be able to access it if they want to. I just don't know how, how good it's going to be, but it's supposed to be able to check ID and check the recommendation and all that kind of thing. So, um, but everyone's creative. They can come up with something. When you think about kids that make fake IDs so they can buy alcohol, you know, you can make a fake ID driver's license along with a fake medical marijuana card. Well, kids really aren't going to need to fake an ID that much because our law is so bad, it's going to be easy for them to get it on their own. So, for example, mm -hmm. because the conditions list is so broad and caregivers can also be users, uh, let's just say in my family of five, that, you know, I could easily get a card, let's say for depression. Um, and here's a picture of my sweet little boy, uh, Brian. Uh, he passed away. This, this Sunday will be the 10 year memorial of his passing. And I know what it's like to fight for a special needs child. Um, and we, we fought for his life living in a hospital room for a year before he passed away. I know these things. So not only do I know what it's like to care for people that are suffering, I know what it's like to be a parent that is desperate to find something good for their child. So I sympathize, especially with parents of autistic kids or kids with rare epilepsy, but it's no excuse to bring in something that will harm other people. And, um, but you could say because of what my husband and I've been through, sure, we have depression, 
let us get a marijuana card. Uh, I have a 16-year-old daughter with di diagnosed with epilepsy. She doesn't need cannabis. I don't want her to have cannabis now that I know what it does to, you know, the egg and developing babies, but I could still use that as an excuse. Let me get a card. Um, you know, I have a son that's in college and maybe he feels anxious. Maybe he can say he has panic disorder and he gets one. He's 19. He can get it for whatever cause he wants to. And then, you know, I have a 12 year old and, and I'm, well, we can come up with something because right now in the law, there's no requirement to have like a pediatrician check behind this cannabis doctor. So theoretically, our whole family could have it, you know, and you can, according to the law, have up to 70 doses, daily doses on your person at one time. So that means 350 doses of marijuana in my house. That almost sounds like a business proposal, doesn't it? And when you have kids in the home and parents in the home, and then you're going to have other people coming and visiting your house, how easy is it for my kids' friends, my son's college friends, to also take part in that? So it's almost too much trouble to go through getting a fake ID because the loopholes in our current law just make it too easy for kids to get it anyway. Going back, uh, Christine, to the pure purity of the product uh, mm -hmm. comments that you made uh, concerning the fact that when you get it through a pharmacy at this point, you know it's been uh, it's it's a vetted product, you know, and it's it's more pure than what you would get through a dispensary because of the lack of oversight there. Mm -hmm. But um, I was just thinking about growers um, to to for the dispensaries. If it, just looking at our area, the farming that's that uses chemical farming, you know, where they ground out the crops with whatever, kill the weeds with with a spray chemical, and so the the, the soil is pretty saturated with chemicals in a lot of our farm area in the state, anyway. Right. But then, um, then knowing I, I read that, and you can you can negate this if it's not true that cannabis is kind of a scavenger plant that it actually will uh will clean the soil of of good and bad elements so like they planted it around the chernobyl uh area when they had the um the incident there where mm -hmm. there was contamination in order to clean the soil so the the plant actually you know would would clean the soil so of course all of those contaminants were in the plant so then if yes. there are if there are no uh regulations for that and that kind of thing is happening our soil is pretty contaminated and so that that cannabis would be yeah. right that, and that's why that's why the fda medicines they can't they can't manufacture their cannabis based medicines from the plant because of that fact uh there's so many heavy metals contaminants toxins the glyphosate uh the cannabis plant is also notorious for um, growing fungus and um, it, it takes lots of chemicals to, you know, to keep it going. So that, that's why, you know, the FDA, they have to use, they, they create it from synthetic sources. So when you hear these proponents for these marijuana dispensaries say, oh, but so their medicine is synthetic, ours is natural. Well, okay, first of all, um, it's not natural unless you're, you yourself, you've pulled it up out of the ground, you shook off the dirt, and, and you're using the leaf, the buds from the plant, right? Um, this is going to be heavily processed, and they use chemicals on a plant that's already soaked up many chemicals in order to get it as purified as they possibly can. They can't call it pharmaceutical grade uh, because that's the term you reserve for actual pharmaceuticals. They're trying to call it medical grade or therapeutic grade. So it, it might be, you know, better off than, you know, the plant that you got from the ground, but it's still going to be highly adulterated. So don't let them tell you, oh, this is natural or this is pure. No, it's, it's, it's been messed with. It's been adulterated. It's just not the same. And they're not legally bound. They don't have, they have, they have protection from lawsuits. So if they don't produce a safe product for you, if they don't produce a good product, you, you can't really sue them. And you can't sue the cannabis doctor for giving you that recommendation card um, erroneously. So if that doctor did, did not 
cross their T's and dot their I's and really check your record, which most cannabis doctors never do. It's a very quick process. You really can't sue them for malpractice either. Do you have some good suggestions for people to have the city council? And I know a lot of people here might run into, uh, you know, their city council member in another meeting. Could you just kind of tell everybody in the audience some of the things we need to ask of the city council? Well, without a doubt, um, you need to insist that the city council reverse course and opt back out immediately because you are on a short timeline and you that your city council should opt out, step back, reassess, study the data, allow for public debate, um, and then according to what the community really wants based on accurate data, if you want to bring forth an ordinance to opt in to have dispensaries, then then by your citizen consent, then you can give your city council the okay. Uh, but there's going to be very little that you can do for the future of your area unless you get them to opt right back out again. Because once they put in their money and they put down roots, they will threaten to sue Jasper into, you know, out of existence should you resist and try to get them out afterwards. Yeah, we don't have any idea what research they used, you know, if they were uh, contacted by, you know, any type of marijuana interest. Um, so, you know, we just don't have any idea uh, what kind of vetting process, you know, they took to go ahead and opt in. Well, a text you sent uh, when we were talking about it, you said, ask them to show you what information they used to make such a weighty decision. Ask them names of their advisors, mm -hmm. which companies presented to them, any copies of documents or PowerPoints, and any expert consultation. I could, I'm not a betting person, but I bet you they can't prove, pull any of these out. Um, the only thing they can yeah. work with a, was the industry. And, uh, but Jessica had a, question for oh well I think um is this is this new cannabis not genetically modified and chemically enhanced very different from what it used to be back in the 60s like this is a completely different product I think it is I think it was this is a it is created for it's more of a euphoric you know hallucinogenic type thing. Right. And it's funny at this slide that I have up here. Do you see this on the screen? This mm -hmm. is other myths youth believe. Do you see this? Yes. Okay. It's funny. So it's Jessica, it's funny that you asked that because I'm just, I'm just popping up slides while we're talking. So this right here is that most kids think, you know, people think what's the problem. It's just a little pot. Well, today's pot is different. THC potency has been bred into the plant. In the 80s, potency averaged 4%. Today, it is 15 to 20. Now, that's just potency in the plant. That's before you process it and concentrate it. Youth will then take extracts and concentrate them more. It's a process called dabbing. Uh, marijuana, they think mar marijuana is organic and natural. Growing and processing often utilizes harsh chemicals and pesticides. So, um, so now today's plant is normally around the 20% in potency. And then when you process it, it increases in potency. And we don't have a potency cap in our state. And so if you go above about 10 to 15% of THC potency, that's when you start seeing the psychoses, the schizophrenia, um, a lot of these things in the news about mass gun violence, that has to do with, um, with, with marijuana. And um, the potency is just high. And then when the youth takes, say, the gummies, or some other substance and they concentrate it down, they heat it up, it's called dabbing, and, and you're basically dealing with 90 to 100% um, THC. We're and, saying, have you, sorry. No, go ahead. Have you seen any other municipalities reverse a force? No. No state has ever been able to stop it. It's only gotten stronger. Um, what I mean they, is the cities, from where where they've opted in and then there's been some no 
outrage and then they've opted back out. What I mean, what's the what's the likelihood of this happening? I mean, is well, it possible for us to make a change here? Um, you know, likelihood, a uh, percentage of likelihood doesn't matter to me uh, because if we're looking at cities in Alabama, this is also new. So what what I've been doing and others have been doing is going around the state to educate to prevent places from opting in. So now that we have our list of those municipalities that did opt in, we can go through that list and alert people, just like you know those of you in Jasper that woke up and realized what happened to you five days before Christmas. Uh, so, so this, if there's going to be a time to increase the likelihood, now is the time to do it. In California, when California brought in their medical program, 80% of the municipalities opted out. In Colorado, when they started their medical program, I think it's 70, 70% 70 of their municipalities were opted out. And look at where they are today. And because the, the industry has so much money, they eventually take over your who your your representatives are they buy them out uh we won't have a a pro you know fighting crime attorney general or da all those things get compromised over time okay you know i've heard over years i've heard over the years people say nobody can ever overdose on pot never heard of anybody dying of an overdose well, I just took a few minutes yesterday and just kind of Googled, and anybody can do this. Um, recently, there was a four-year-old who got a hold of some gummies at his home. Eight, we don't know how many, but died from that. Yeah. Um, and then an 11-month-old, don't know how baby got a hold of anything, don't know if it was don't know how, but um, that they when they went did autopsy, THC was in the 11 months old system. Yes, and so there are, I mean, and then there's there were multiple articles of um, all sorts of use in emergency rooms um, for horrible side effects. You're absolutely right. Uh, so the, the, the careless comment when people say, you know, marijuana doesn't kill anybody. I've never heard of that before. Um, is it just it just belies how little they actually know about the subject? And as you said, it doesn't take much research research to kind of scratch beneath the surface. So we we do see that the the greatest number of victims are our young and our vulnerable because of accidental ingestion, um, and our ERs will be full of it. Uh, children end up on the ventilator often. And they do die. Suicide is pretty much a final thing. And when you have cannabis responsible for being the number one substance in completed teen suicide in Colorado, and most likely in other states, that's pretty deadly. So uh, thank you for doing that research, because you're absolutely right. It does kill. And potency, frequency of use, and age of onset, the age those are the three factors. And again, right now, we don't have those protections in our state. In within the dispensaries, if it's stated what forms are going to be sold, like, for example, yeah. kids, kids are going to get a hold of it no matter what. But like, I work in the school system, so we have a ton of kids who vape, and they're finding that THC is within the vape. So if they already have an issue with that and then mixing it with others, is that going to be a form that's sold within? Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much for working in the school system. And another thing I'll, I'll bring up real quickly is, um, you know, every, every community, whether or not you have a dispensary or not, every single school system is going to have to address the fact, are we going to allow our teachers to be on this? Are we going to allow, uh, most likely bus drivers can't because they do have, you know, ALDOT, some drug testing. But you're going to have to pass some resolutions saying, hey, wait, anybody in care of a child cannot be on this because there'll be people saying, hey, this is medicine, I should be on this, right? That's that's something to consider. Now, uh, the kids with the vape, with the THC, unfortunately, that is from the legalization of growing and processing hemp. 
So your friendly little hemp farmer down the road is responsible for this crisis. And what they do is they sell their excess hemp to places like Tennessee and Georgia, and they get it hyper-processed. And it's a process we call acetylation. It's a chemical process to turn it into a Delta-8, Delta-10, delta aught, which is terrible. It's worse than marijuana. Comes back in our state and it is technically a hemp product. And so it's sold in these vape shops, these CBD shops and kids are getting it and it is very dangerous. And yes, they could um, take the, the, the medical product that someone in their house or neighbor down the street or friend is getting through the dispensaries, mm -hmm. through the oils, or the, um, they can squeeze it out of the soft gels. Uh, they can use the nebulizer component. They can take the, the gummy. Um, yes, and in, intensify even more the potency. Um, people are committing suicide just by using these THC vapes. And, and unfortunately, that's a whole other form of legislation that we need to take care of. Um, on a side note, the 2018 Farm Bill, which uh, what has been a disaster for our country, it is what's responsible for legalizing you know, the use of hemp, but it has, has too many loopholes. It's coming up for review um, at the federal level this year. So at the federal level, we need to be telling our, uh, our representatives, hey, we need to stop this processing of hemp. We need to stop these Delta 8s, 10s, and aughts. It's making the problem worse. That is a whole other activity to do. Um, but you're right. They can still illegally get their hands on these, uh, these vape products take the medical dispensary stuff and mix it together and they will get very sick. Well, I have to, I have to get going. Um, I just heard my son from college walked in the door and I need to drive my daughter to work. Christine, thank you so You're so much. welcome. <laughs> hey, life takes over, right? But uh, please let me know yeah. if you need anything. I'll be happy to help. And um, as soon as I'm able to get up to Jasper and present to your leaders, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I hope okay. I hope in your group we've had some pastors or faith leaders too. We need to get this message out to the churches. Uh, yes, you're going to bear the, you're going to bear the brunt of it um, a lot because of the suffering that will happen in people's lives. Thank you. Bye bye.